politician and diplomat, president of the Republic of Estonia from 2006 up until 2016, our very own rock and roll president, Thomas Erenkilis. <laughs> Sitting right over there was uh, uh, Tim Troitsky, who had his foot in the cast. So there's been some improvement, uh, <laughs> but not much. <laughs> At least on this side, it's the same stuff all over again. Anyway, um, I don't know. I mean, it's it's all a result of shouldering the burden of office. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Anyway, ten years ago, un um, and unbeknownst to me, uh, I mean, unbeknownst to other people, to me, it was, they were known, but I, I began to talk on uh, music and politics and sort of social change by presenting a video of a band that, uh, and the video had only had been watched about 400 times, and it wasn't, this band was not known outside the the Russian-speaking audience, this was Pussy Riot. Now it's known everywhere, but anyway, I showed them as an example of what what music can do. And uh, today I'm going to take this up again because of this question. I mean, do we sing our way into into freedom? And my answer really is, yeah, but but actually no, uh, because it's been because music has been part of this culture for. Very, a very long time, and actually, much of what I'm going to talk about today is actually kind of a <clears throat> a tour de table of uh, of Estonian culture and music through through philosophical developments and historical developments in Europe. Um, so let me begin with uh, the first slide, which you can leave, put up again. I mean, put up now and later on in between some songs. Here's the first slide. The map. Come. Okay. We are Finno Ute, Finno Ugrics. <coughs> and as you can see, we don't really, these are the people who speak this funny language, which is called Finno Ute, which is, I mean, the language group is Finno Ute. And it includes. Please take the microphone while you're there. So we have digitally people that are watching this. Yeah, okay. It, uh, is it on? Can you hear me? Yes. This is from actually a big series. I would highly advise buying this if you have any interest in it. It's called The Song of Forgotten People, which is a key to understanding our, our singing revolution later on. Because this was written in the 1970s and 80s, and the title of this is Songs of Forgotten Peoples. And these are all the people who are dying out under Soviet rule. Uh, I mean, there are no Finnish songs there, but you have Karelian songs and Vapsin songs and Ingrian, Vodic, and Livonian and Estonian. Because that was the big existential fear of Estonians until we became independent again. That we're going to lose our language, we will be absorbed. I mean, this, it's happened basically to the Livonians, as I said, they were, you know, Lithuanianized. I mean, Latvians are Lithuanianized Livonians. <laughs> but, I mean, the point is that, you know, uh, if you meet a tall person in Latvia, their <laughs> odds are they are Livonian. I'm pretty tall. I mean, I'm a meter 86. But I went to the Livonian Cultural Center, and it was the first time since I was about 13 that everyone was taller than I am. Because, look around, what is this? Anyway, so this is so this is part of our existential angst, which we have to often deal with in this country. Now, this is not the this is not the choir music of the. It is choir music. It is not the choir music, uh, or the tr choir music tradition that came out of. Oh shit! It's getting late. I'm around. <laughs> that came out of um, uh, that that I talked about. Now. Meanwhile, I have to look at the rest of Europe because this becomes crucial for understanding how all this develops. Which is, all right, well, this is very short, if you speak Russian. 
Um, you know, first we had finally, you know, Europe rewakes in down in you know southern in Italy, in the city states, and you have something called the Renaissance. They discover discover the classical period. Um, they discover classical philosophy, all of which has been out for like whatever, 800 years, and suddenly go, oh wow, all this smart stuff was written, and. <laughs> And so this, it was slowly made its way down from Italy up to the rest of Europe. Uh, this sort of, uh, the understanding Greek and Roman philosophers, um, especially notable is uh, De Rerum Natura by, what's his name? I'm tired, I slept three hours last night. Anyway, De Rerum Natura. <laughs> This leads to people started thinking about science, and you get, you know, um, Galileo Galilei positing the heliocentric universe, and, you know, the Pope threatened, threatening to torture him to death, says, yeah, I, we can't, I didn't say it, but he st still said, yet it moves still. You didn't buy it. That was 1632, you know, a little uh, skip ahead another 30 years, you have Newton inventing or coming up with his theory of gravity or gravitational theory. And so science started moving quickly. Not here, but down there. And then, because science was already that sort of, it was making inroads, math and physics, people started saying, well, what about, let's apply this to human beings too. Which led to something we all know as the Enlightenment, in which people started saying, well, I mean, we, why do we have this divine right of kings? Why are you a king? Just because God made you king? And said, That's God, you know? I mean, so, so then you ended up with this theory of human beings. And picking up from Protagoras's, man is the measure of all things, rather than, you know, God and all this other stuff, um, we end up with a point of view, mainly in Scotland and France, that truth was not what God said it was, or what the church said it was, or what the Pope said it was, what is empirically visible, or you can see it, you know, sort of, it's worked until deep fakes, uh, but you can believe it uh, if it really, if you can see it, and that if you can measure it, if you can de derive it logically, as Newton did, also Leibniz in Germany, um, uh, which led to kind of thinking, in, you know, among philosophers like George, <clears throat> like uh, John Locke and Voltaire and Diderot, that well, um, people maybe are equal, and maybe people, you know, kings are not special, and maybe if they're not special, then why the hell are they ruling us? And maybe we should have something called democracy which had been a word ever since about 14, about 450 BC with the Greeks, and then it all started, started coming back. And so, this became this dominant Anglo-Franco uh, French idea, or Scottish idea, first applied, oddly enough, by the people who read this stuff, which were the Americans and Thomas Jefferson, who then said, hmm, let's have a declaration of independence, and it, you know, that, uh, all men are created equal. No one ever said that before, in politics at least. Uh, and that's how you got the Americans. Now the French took this up in a big way, in a good and bad way. Um, I mean the French, mainly, I mean you can say Voltaire and Diderot, uh, Voltaire the, and Diderot of the encyclopedias, wanted to capture all knowledge in the great encyclopedias. They were looking around saying, well this is, you know, we're living in darkness. We have these priests telling us what's true and what's not true, yet, you know, that's what they're saying is nonsense. And, um, and actually then they did this thing, they had this idea to show how bad all of this despotic priestly rule was, that, it, but you couldn't write about it in France because you get <coughs> your head cut off in a guillotine. Well, in a guillotine, that was a later invention, but in any case, so what they did was they started collecting travel logs of people who went to Eastern Europe. And, of course, the travel logs of life in Eastern Europe were pretty bleak, and, you know, and this is the beginning of this 
Edward Said type Orientalist view of Eastern Europe as a dark, backward place. Today, it's not dark, it's more gray people living in gray apartment blocks, <laughs> uh, gray lives, and it's why 30 years after our independence, you still say, in the former Soviet Republic of Estonia, which, I mean, give me a break. 1975, 30 years after World War II, I was already a student in college. I never saw anyone write about the former Nazi state of Germany. You know, I mean, it just didn't happen, right? Germany is Germany, right? Well, you know, on the occasion of the 30th anniversary, especially in Deutschland, where's the German word? <laughs> there it is. It's always the Ehemalige Soviet Republic Estland. Like, wait a minute, it's 30 years. Folks, stop. And we're far more advanced than Germany when it comes to anything digital. Anything digital. <laughs> 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 So this was like the Enlightenment idea. This was not appealing to everyone. Least of all did it, appe uh, did it appeal to a German pastor in Riga, because by that time we'd all been Lutheranized. Well, not the Lithuanians, but we'd been Lutheranized uh, as a result of the Reformation. We didn't have much to say about it, but you know our German overlord said, "Okay, now you're Lutheran. We are Lutheran." Uh, the good thing about this was they all learned to read, which is the great advantage of Lutheranism over other forms of religion, which is that you, in order to be a member of the church, you had to be confirmed. Had to, that, we call that Lehr in Estonian, which comes from the German, which means to learn and read. But anyway, so we all know how to read, and we had a, except for one group of Estonians, um, the people here in Setuma, which were not part, they were part of the Russian Empire. They did never got Lutheranized. And as a result, they had like a, they had a literacy rate of 70% at the, at the end of the uh, 19th century in the old Russia census, whereas Estonia had a 92% literacy rate in the old Russia census of 1896. But Herder was head there was like not a fan of the Enlightenment and he really hated the fact that in the uh, in the court of Frederick the Great they all spoke French. He saying you should be speaking you should be speaking German, French. So I had them hanging out in Riga and he takes these trips and then he's inspired by the Latvians and the Estonians. Because they were saying, because they, he, they wrote a book called Stimmen der Völker in Irren Leiden. Leiden, sorry. Leiden. <laughs> you can say my German is rusty. I used to live there, but you know, it's all. Anyway, he wrote this book, which was like a huge, huge success. And the idea of it was that the fundamental unit of culture, of, of man, Mankind is not the individual, as in the United States and the UK and in France. And the, you know, the French had the Declaration, Human Universal Declaration of of Man, the droit de l'homme. You know, this is the individual's rights. He said, "Look, what really defines culture, or what really defines people, is the culture they belong to, and what determines their." Uh, their culture, I mean their, what their unit, is the culture that is expressed in their poetry. So, I mean basically Stimme der Völker is voices of the people. And he collected these Latin and, and uh, Estonian folk songs. And sort of, and so what came out of that was an understanding among Germans, in Germany, that culture is Culture is a group, I mean, the, the unit of humanity is the culture, the language. And there's a big success and had a huge effect on Germany. Not all of it was so good, if you can imagine, that the rights of the group are greater than the rights of the individual. And uh, it led to some not so nice guys like, you know, Fichte, sort of taking this even further and talking about sort of the the state is the guarantor of the of this culture, 
and that was not so good. Now, this is the context in which the Estonian culture is formed. First of all, we have all this finno ugric stuff coming in, right? On the other hand, we have this German thing, and we're, you know, smart Estonians all spoke German, and they were into this too. So, what the Germans did, as part of this, actually came out of Switzerland, but in, well, what Germany really took up on was something called Liedertafel, which means song table. Uh, I don't know why it's called the table, but in any case, choral groups started coming together and singing. And this was like a real big thing in the first half of the 19th century. And it was also part of this whole, like, you know, we're all Germans and we all speak German and we all sing German. And so that's what we do. And the Estonians said, hmm, that's not a bad idea. We sing better anyway. And, uh, <laughs> and so, 1864, the first all-German song festival took place. Five years later, the first Estonian song festival took place, right? I mean, we copy this stuff, right? I mean, it's, we're unabashed in this regard. And so, the, the thing with Liedertafel in Germany is that it kind of died out. It's just like, okay, that was nice, 1864, but, eh. You know, I mean, new things came along. Schumann, Schubert, I mean, it's so much more interesting than Liedertafel. We, of course, kept singing Liedertafel. We sing it to this day. The All Estonia Song Festival we have every five years is a direct descendant of the first Estonian uh, Song Festival of 1869, which is just basically a copy of the 1865 Song Festival. 1864, whatever. So, so in the meantime, what happens here and didn't happen so much in Germany is that it became slowly politicized. Because first of all, the first political thing is that Estonia, like what we know as Estonia today, is actually cut in half right down the this diagonal. In the south, we had Lvov, we had Liefland, which also included, I mean, there were three provinces. There was like Estland up here, Liefland here, and uh, we had Kurland here. And so um, and we said, screw those, uh, those uh, administrative units. Everyone who speaks Estonian is part of this one culture, and that's what we're going to sing, and we're not going to define ourselves by the administrative borders of the <laughs> Russian Empire. So, you can see this, there was this constant tension between this people saying, we are Estonians, and we have one culture, and we're like part of this whole tradition that was invented by Herden. And then there are other people saying, no, 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 we are liberals. I mean, we believe in the rights of the individual human being. Human, I mean, if you look, in fact, at the Estonian Declaration of Independence, it is much more influenced by the liberal tradition, uh, Anglo-Franco, Liberal tradition, um, that uh, that was in opposition to this, and of course, uh, all of the uh, the cultural national stuff was uh, kicked into especially high gear with Woodrow Wilson coming out with his 14 points at the end of World War One, talking about the self determination <laughs> of nations, which led to the independence of every country from Finland down to Turkey, basically. Almost every country. Right? So Hungarians, all these people suddenly became independent. Czechoslovakia, Poland, I mean, they were, we all self-determined ourselves. So there was this constant pull. But what remained the same throughout this period was the Song Festival. And that is what we have, which brought us to our current position. Now, the thing about the, um, but the song festival is that it's always been political. But so has all of our music has been political. The first political set was actually having a song festival in 1869, saying we are Estonians and we don't really care about your borders. And then we had various people sort of thinking about things like independence. 
What we have seen, especially under the Soviet period, so as I mentioned, the song, the song cycle called the Songs of Forgotten People, we all started to feel oppressed because our language, then, you know, we've been here like 3,000 years, uh, giving, you know, learning words from Latvian and giving Latvian some of our words, but we've been around for a long time, but we were being squeezed out. And as it happens with the Livonians and it's happened with the Karel, with the Ingrians, there were 200,000 Ingrians in around the Petersburg area, 200,000 in 1918. There are most optimistically 8,000 and Ingrian speakers probably around 800. So this is, I mean, it really does happen. Cultures get snuffed out. And this is what was our great existential on. So we started, and what do we have? If you're being politically oppressed, it's hard to say stuff because you get arrested, you know, like in Russia today. I mean, you say the wrong thing and you go to jail. Uh, but you, and, but you can't sing, and you can sing folk songs, and you can combine old traditional forms with new forms. So, for example, uh, with the Santa Mangi, the Yanni, this is a, an Estonian band that actually re has 100-year-old rec recordings of Estonian Hanavalo's birth. This is a band called Travitat. But you'll hear the old recording come in and out. It is not look at things by nationality, 
or ethnicity, but it does go to language, which is really the core obsession that we have here because, you know, we only got a million speakers, so. Now, um, and then there are other forms as well of protest. You can put, um, uh, you show, I'll show you two versions of how a, a something taken straight out of the Kalevala from Finland uh, was uh, some pretty wild sort of Karl Orff-like music. So we have now this is a curse. It is a curse. It is a literal curse. It's called the curse of iron. My friend conducted this in 1984 in Scarlatti's church, and the Italians all walked out because they understood it was really amazing. Uh, they have a good one. I mean, it's a schematic that you get. singing their Kalevala verse on through the 
the adaptation of this to German leader Tafel, which then disappears in Germany, but keeps going here on and on. And we still do it, and we still sing, and that's just who we are. We're just the singing people, the happy singing people. Um, Latvians are too, by the way. <laughs> So I'm not, not, not to feel, I mean, they have kind of a similar story as we do, but, but anyway, that's our story, and that's how we sang ourselves free, by being free always in music. Thank you very much. Hey, hey.